uh, we can read from Romans 11. I asked then, did God reject his people? By no means. I'm an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people for whom he foreknew. Don't you know that the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how we appeal to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I'm the only one left and they're trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bound, bowed their need to bow. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on work. If it was, if it was grace, it would no longer be grace. What then? What the people of Israel sought so on earnestly that they didn't obtain. The elect among them did, but others were hardened as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see, ears that could not hear to this very day. And David says, May their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a tribu retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. Again I ask, did they stum stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches to the Gentiles, how much more greater riches will their full inclusion bring. I'm talking to you Gentiles in as much as an apostle to the Gentiles. I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection was brought reconciliation to the world, what will the acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you though, though wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others, and is now shared in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to other branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you will also be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them again. After all, if you were cut off of an olive tree that is wild by nature, and contrary to the nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, will be grafted into their old olive tree? I do not want you to be ignorant of this ministry, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, and he will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on the account of the patriarchs. For God's gift and his call are irrevocable. Just as you were one, you were one at a time disobedient to God, have you, have you now received as a result of their disobedience? So they too have now become disobedient in order that they they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. Oh, the depth of the riches of wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God? What should God repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. I think he deserves a clap for that, don't you? That's massive. Oh, I've not got my clicker here. Is it possible to have the clicker for the, uh, the slides, please? Thank you. Uh, Josh, thank you for uh, reading the Bible to us. Um, quite a tough passage, quite a long passage. Um, don't understand it all, to be honest, but that's okay. Um, I just, thank you ever so much, Adrian. Thank you. Um, 
I'm going to embarrass Josh as well to tell you that he's actually one of my heroes. Um, Josh is one of the uh, best people in the church at inviting others to come along. Just to ordinary church, he's amazing. He'll invite loads of people. And do you know what? You ought to ask him how they find it because you might be surprised. Talk to Josh afterwards. He's a really inspirational guy. Romans 11. Let's pray, shall we? Father, please send your Holy Spirit to us, that by his power we may understand your word, this hard passage that's difficult to grasp, that by his light we may see the beauty of Jesus. And by his deep work in us, our hearts will be drawn after your heart. For you love the world so much that you gave your only son, that whoever believes in you shouldn't perish, but have eternal life in him. Speak to us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, I'm going to start in a slightly random kind of way by uh, telling you about Tommy. Tommy... Uh, Tommy saw himself as quite a lucky lad when he was growing up. His parents were well off, and they had a big house, and the big house had a big garden, but wait for it, Tommy's pride and joy. At the bottom of the big garden was a big open-air swimming pool. It was his pride and his joy. Tommy loved it. He regarded that swimming pool as his very own. And every day, pretty much, all the way through the winter even, he would get back from school, rip off his uniform, pull on his trunks, and Tommy would be in the pool. Often he'd have a load of friends there as well. And that was great. Although, to be honest, it was a little bit tough for Tommy's sister, because with Tommy and his friends always in, she barely got a look in in this nice pool. Well, Tommy did well uh, in his swimming, and it was really good for him. He was fit, he was healthy, he was energetic, and he was popular. And he got good enough to win some local swimming galas, and on one occasion, he even swam for the county, which is quite impressive. But then Tommy turned 13, and for his 13th birthday, he had a PlayStation, top of the range, beautiful thing. His parents were wise, and they tried to set limits on Tommy's screen time, but it didn't really work. And after a while, they gave up and opted for a quiet life. Let Tommy get on with it. No trouble, really. And uh, Tommy's mates had the same model of PlayStation as well, and they absolutely loved it. Tommy would sometimes say, as he looked back on his earlier years, he'd say, why freeze to death in an outdoor swimming pool when you can have just as much fun in the warmth of your bedroom, playing on your PlayStation? And he meant it as well. Well, the PlayStation was Tommy's new pride and joy, and the pool was quickly forgotten. It was empty. Until Tommy's sister noticed that the pool was empty, and she spotted her opportunity started swimming, started bringing her friends along. They're having a lot of fun. There were no more swimming galas for Tommy, though. He didn't care. He, uh, he was putting on weight, actually, because instead of all the exercise, he was just vegging in front of the screen the whole time. But he didn't care. Most of his mates were the same. And uh, to be honest, Tommy was getting pretty tired because in order to keep mum and dad off his back, he would pretend to go to sleep at night. And then once they were in bed, he was up on his PlayStation again, hoping that they wouldn't notice. There were one or two occasions when he even fell asleep in class. But he didn't care. Because to be honest, he was having much more fun than boring old school, wasn't he? Meanwhile, Tommy's sister was making up for lost time. At last, she was free to enjoy that pool, and she was swimming to her heart's content without her pesky brother getting in the way the whole time. And actually, she got pretty good very quickly. And as she toned up, Tommy's sister was starting to get some admiring comments from some of Tommy's friends. Tommy didn't really notice until one of his friends started to fancy her. But to be honest, that friend was always stupid anyway, so Tommy didn't care. 
until one day the phone rang. And it was for Tommy's sister. She had got a call from Swim England and an invitation to join the England Junior Swimming Pool. That's how good she'd become, the swimming squad. That's how good she'd become. And around the same time, Tommy heard about her school report. His sister was on for seven A stars in her GCSEs. <clears throat> Tommy lay back in his chair. He caught a little glimpse of himself in the mirror as he yawned and reached for another bag of Walker's sweet Thai chili crisps. <laughs> and as he caught that glimpse of himself, Tommy asked himself, what am I turning into? Why was his sister, his annoying sister, getting all the fun in the swimming pool? Why was she getting all the success at school and in the swimming galas? Hmm. Tommy heard a hint of a splash at the bottom of the garden as his sister dived smoothly into the pool and glided effortlessly through the water. Suddenly, Tommy knew what he had to do. He took out the plug, yanked out the plug from his PlayStation, threw it away, found his dad's swimming trunks and pulled them on. His home were far too small for him now. And he ran down the garden and plunged into the pool. Tommy was back and nothing was going to stop him. I hope you enjoyed my story. Tommy is a made-up character. To be honest, I was just buying time because this is a bit of a tough passage that I've got to preach to you. <laughs> but in order to get the link for a moment, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of Tommy's dad. Tommy's dad. An old-fashioned kind of guy, really. But think of Tommy's dad just after that PlayStation arrived and he saw the change in his son. You see, Tommy's dad had always wanted a sporty, healthy son. He was kind of pleased about his daughter, but he was a bit old-fashioned about this stuff. He wanted a healthy, sporty son. To be honest, that's why he had bought that house with the swimming pool. It was for Tommy. But now... Why wasn't Tommy in the pool? Yeah, this is great that it was sis his sister was getting into it now, and, and she had a chance. That was good, but would Tommy ever think about that pool again? Would he ever see what he was missing? As we get to Romans chapter 11, we're going to get there at last, the Apostle Paul is wrestling with a similar kind of question. You see... His own people, the Israelites, they had this long, long history with God. Over centuries of their story as a nation, God had promised them many things, promised that he would show them his favor. It's called grace, his undeserved favor, so that they could then show God's goodness to all of the nations. That had been the promise. And all of those promises had now been fulfilled in the coming of Jesus. But here's the thing. The very people who had received all those promises about what God was going to do, when God started to fulfill them in Jesus, seemed to lose interest in the whole plan. They weren't in the pool, if you like, while tons of other people from all the other nations were jumping in and having a great time. They were accepting the message of Jesus and seeming very happy about it because Jesus had set them free. But Paul's own people, that the Paul had been made for, they were playing PlayStation up the road, messing around with other things. They weren't on board. Why? What was happening? Well, that's really been the question behind the whole of Romans 9, 10, and 11. We saw Paul's answer in Romans 9 in terms of somehow this being the outworking of God, God's mysterious plan. And then last week in Romans 10, we saw that in another sense, the responsibility lay with Israel for rejecting the message. But what about the future? Was there any hope? Would Israel ever see what they were missing, like Tommy suddenly remembering the pool that he used to love. And might they come back? Or was it just too late 
for Paul's people, the people of Israel? Had they given up their chance of knowing God? Had God actually rejected them? That was the burning question. Chapter 11, verse 1, I ask then, did God reject his people, reject Israel? And the answer is very clear, that God hasn't rejected them. After all, Paul, the driving force of the Christian movement at the time, he was himself an Israelite, verse 1. And though sometimes he felt it was a bit of a lonely path, if he looked around him, there were other people from the nation of Israel who were following Jesus as well. And actually, you can see this in verses 1 to 10, we can't look at all the detail, but have a glance back over Israel's history, and you'll see this is often the way it was. There were people, often a small number, who believed the word of God in Israel. And then there were others, sometimes the majority, sometimes a large number, who were rejecting God. But there was still that few, that remnant, who held on. You can see the example in Elijah's day that Paul illustrates there in the middle of the passage. But now it's just the same. Paul is in exactly the same position. He wasn't alone. Verse 4, what was God's answer to Elijah? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Elijah, you're not alone even if you think you are, and neither are you, Paul. Verse 5, so too at the present time there is a remnant, a small number chosen by grace and following Jesus. It's nothing new, he says. This is no evidence that God has rejected his people. Actually, this is how the story has so often been throughout their history. But then, second question. Have they lost the possibility of coming back? Sorry, I've got behind on my, uh, on my slides. Have they lost the possibility of coming back? Verse 11 Again, I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Was there any future hope for Israel, he's asking? And again, the answer is very clear. Verse 11, not at all. No, that isn't the game plan. Instead, it's almost as if because Israel has not received Jesus, they've kind of left room in the pool for the other nations to come in to God's blessing. Lots of people from the other nations jumping in now, middle of verse 11, not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, because they've rejected the message of Jesus, salvation has come to the Gentiles. And of course, that's exactly how Paul's own mission worked. You can read about it in the book of Acts. He would start, whenever he went to a new place, by preaching in the synagogue to the Jewish people. Generally speaking, a few would respond but most would reject him. And after that rejection, he would go and evangelize the non-Jewish people, the Gentiles. It was as if they'd made space for the Gentiles to come in. But that wasn't the end of the plan. Because God's plan all the way through was that the joy of the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, in knowing Jesus, would eventually provoke Israel to long for what they had so that they too would return and jump in. You saw it in verse 11, didn't you? Not at all, rather because of their transgression, because the, Gen the Jewish people have largely rejected Jesus, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel envious. In other words, they were gonna see in the life of these Gentile believers what Jesus could do for them, that the Messiah had come to rescue them, that he had given them salvation, set them free, brought them back into the embrace of God, and Israel would look on and think, oh, that's what we're missing. That's what we were made for. It's what we long for. And they'd want to get back in the pool. Have a look at verse 13, where you get the same thing going on. He says, I'm talking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, them saying no to Jesus meant the nations come in, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? He's kind of saying, look, if Israel rejecting 
the good news, has led to people from all the other nations come in. That's pretty good. But imagine then the time when Israel starts to accept the good news, and then, fantastic, you've got the whole world included. All the nations and Israel. How good's that going to be? He says it's going to be as good as life from the dead. In other words, Jesus is going to return and claim the whole of creation for his own. And we're going to be raised to live with him in new creation life forever. The nations united at the feet of Jesus because God's mysterious plan has unfolded. Life from the dead. He says it's like Israel was a cultivated tree that it had lots of its branches cut off. And then the Gentile nations were like a kind of wild tree. And a load of their branches have been grafted in to Israel, to the cultivated tree. But if God can do that with these wild branches over here from the nations, then of course those branches that were cut off from the, the, the cultivated tree, he can graft back in. Of course he can. And actually, he will. That's the plan. It's as if the cycle of blessing has turned full circle from the Jewish people onto the Gentile people and then turning back to the Jewish people in order that the whole world, all of the nations are included. Can you see what an incredible and thrilling plan this is? Doesn't it make you marvel and worship at the mystery of God and the strangeness of his ways? And so we reach the goal, verses 25 and 26, where all of the nations will be saved and all of Israel will be saved. Verse 25, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part. Many of them have rejected Jesus. Until the full number of the Gentiles, the nations, has come in. The full number, all of the nations. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. Do you get that? The full number of the nations and all of Israel. Can you feel the expansiveness of God's plan? Can you feel the bigness of God's heart? It doesn't mean that every Gentile person or every Jewish person will be saved. We might feel we'd like to believe that, but you can't square that even with the rest of Romans, let alone with the rest of the Bible. But it does mean that the heart of God is huge. And that as well as planning to save a vast number of people from all the nations of the world, he does also plan to save many Jewish people too. That's almost certainly what this phrase, all Israel will be saved, means. It doesn't mean every Israelite without exception. It means every Israelite without distinction. In other words, all kinds of people, a very large number of people from among the, uh, the Jewish nation coming to find in Jesus their true Messiah. And not by a back door into salvation that bypasses Jesus. What Paul is anticipating, I think, is a moment to come when such a large number of Jewish people turn and put their trust in Jesus. That a bit like we might sometimes say, the whole nation turned out to watch the royal wedding. That doesn't mean like every single person, but loads and loads of people. So like the whole nation was gathered in the same way. All Israel will be saved. This is a hugely exciting prospect and something for which we should pray. God hasn't rejected his ancient people, but he has a plan for them as he has a plan for the nations. Which moves us on. God's plan for Israel, God's plan for the nations. You'll be relieved to know this is going to be much briefer, okay? Because we've already seen quite a bit of it as we've gone through. But just two strands to draw out. The first is that a bit like Tommy's loss of interest in the pool opened up the opportunity for his sister and her friends to swim, so the rejection of Jesus by most of Paul's Jewish contemporaries had created this huge opportunity for the non-Jewish nations to be reached, as we saw in verse 11. And the key thing is that this isn't some afterthought. This isn't some plan B. God's plan was always... That through blessing Abraham's family, the family would get expanded. 
and all the nations of the world would be drawn into the blessing. You can read about it in Genesis 12, 2 and 3. All the nations of the world will be blessed through you, Abraham, and through your family, God says. And of course, that's the reason why most of us are here this evening. The majority of us are not from Israel, not Jewish people, but we have been brought into their story and become inheritors of their blessings. And that mission to reach all the nations, it's continuing. That's why we are still passionate to send people to reach the nations, whether it's the nations gathered here in Southampton, isn't that wonderful, the great opportunities we have here, or whether it's the nations in their homes all across the world, sending people to the nations to reach them for Jesus in their own communities. Why? Because this is the heart of God. He loves the world in all its breadth, in all its diversity. That's the first stage. But then the second stage is that the believers from the nations, the Gentile believers, become part of passing the blessing back to the Jewish people. I just want to say I'm not talking here about the current politics of the Middle East. I'm talking specifically about sharing Jesus with Jewish people, like we want to share Jesus with all people. Verse 13 again. I'm talking to you Gentiles in as much as I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. I can take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people, the Jewish people, to envy and save some of them. And that envy here isn't a bad thing. It's a glorious thing. He's talking about stirring in them a desire for the very thing that they were made for and that God most longs to give them, which is his son, Jesus their Messiah, envious to know the Messiah. And both stages of this plan are needed in order for God's mission to be complete. The nations gathered and the Jewish people rescued. God's plan for the nations. Finally, God's word for us. God's word for us. What does this mean for us today, whether we are from a Jewish background or from a Gentile background? What does it mean? Just a few takeaways. I think we have to say in today's world, this does mean that there is no place in the church for anti-Semitism. I hope I don't even need to say that, but we do need to say it. Paul had to make it clear, even in the first century, It's still crucial. It is to our great shame that Christian history has sometimes been scarred with negative attitudes or even hatred towards the Jewish people. Paul would have none of it. They were his own people, and he was passionate for their welfare. Verse 17, if some of the branches have been broken off, that's the Israelites who have rejected Jesus, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in, that's the Gentiles coming into God's plan, and now sharing the nourishing sap from the olive root, don't consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. In other words, if we're not from a Jewish background, it is right for us humbly to recognize our debt to the Jewish people. And to recognize that we have been spliced in to their story, which is wonderful. There's no place in the church for anti-Semitism. Second thing, we need to learn from the lessons of Israel's history. Verse 19, you will say, branches were broken off so that I could be uh, be grafted in. Granted. But they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith. Don't be arrogant, but tremble. For if God didn't spare the natural branches, he won't spare you either. See, no one gains God's favor automatically simply by right of birth. That was the mistake of so many Israelites. No, we receive God's blessing only by trusting his promises, by faith, verse 20. So, don't make that same, mistake, that same mistake yourself. Don't assume that just because your parents were Christian, if they were, you can just mess around with God and everything will be fine. That was Israel's mistake again and again. But God doesn't work like that. Whatever our backgrounds, every one of us must face the claims of Jesus 
for ourselves. God only has children. He doesn't have grandchildren. Don't make the same mistake that so many Israelites made. Face Jesus for yourself and make that decision, the most important decision of your life, to follow him. Don't mess around. Number three, care for the nations, care for the Jewish people. Because we need to keep remembering that God cares for both. Now again, I'm not talking about uncritical partisan support for the modern day state of Israel in the politics of the Middle East. God loves the Jewish people. God loves the Palestinian and Arab people too. But we should pray for Jewish people to come to Jesus, just as we should pray for people from all the nations to come to him. I hope it's not out of turn to say, but there are some Christians who are very, very focused on praying for Jewish people to come to faith. And sometimes you think, well, yeah, but what about the nations? But then sometimes you get the opposite problem of people who are passionate to pray for all of the world, but will you ever hear them pray for the Jewish people? Both are out of step with the heart of God because he loves the whole world, Jew and Gentile. And we should care for the nations and care for the Jewish people. And pray for people to come to know him from all those backgrounds. And it's crucial that we see that God's mission usually advances through the obedience and through the participation of his people. So he has this incredible plan, this plan for the nations, this plan for the Jewish people. But he wants us to be part of it. So the challenge for us is to capture this expansive, ambitious heart of God to reach all segments of our city, all the nations in our city and to go to the ends of the earth to share his love in word and deed. So let's feel that challenge. That challenge to be so set on fire for Jesus, so alive with his praise, so free in his grace, so welcoming in our embrace to others, that Jewish people and all kinds of people are actually provoked to envy and long to have what we have. I wonder, does your Christian life provoke anyone to envy? Because it's meant to. That's the challenge. And of course, that's never going to happen if we allow the slightest hint of anti-Semitism in our midst. It's never going to happen if we pray for every other group of people but never pray for the Jewish people. If we love the nations but actually fail to love God's ancient people into whose story we have now come. No, care for the nations, care for the Jewish people, because God cares for both. And finally, not quite finally, penultimately, remember that for all of us, is that a new word, penultimately? I don't know where that came from. Anyway, it means one more to come after this, but it's a quick one. Remember that for all of us, Our only hope is in God's mercy. How is it that we can find the favor of God and be in relationship with him? How can we discover the life for which we were made? Well, that's the basic question that every religion in the world wants to answer. And actually, the answer that every religion in the world gives begins with the same three letters. The letters are N-E-R. Every religion in the world answers the question, how can you get the favor with God with a word that begins with those three letters, M, E, and R? Almost every religion adds to the the letters M, E, R, the letters I and T, merit, merit. You earn God's favor by being good enough. That's the answer of most religions. But there's one exception. The God of the Bible tells you that M-E-R-I-T, merit, will never get you into the favor of God. He is too holy and we are too flawed. Instead, the God of the Bible adds the letters C 
and why to M-E-R. And he tells us that our hope is in his mercy, his forgiveness, his undeserved kindness. And the great thing is, when it comes to merit, goodness, even the best of us don't really have too much of it when we're honest with ourselves. But when it comes to mercy, God is rich in mercy. He's got plenty of it. He's got enough mercy, even for John Risbridger in all his messed upness. And if he's got enough mercy for me, he's got enough mercy for you as well. And in that, we can find our hope, our security, and our everlasting life. Verse 32, God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all, Jewish people and people from all of the nations. So whether you're from a Jewish background or a non-Jewish background, the problem that we face is the same. Romans 1 to 3, we've rebelled against God, we're under his wrath, but the answer is the same too. And it's the answer that God has shown his mercy in Jesus Christ, who bore the wrath that we deserved on the cross so we could be forgiven and set free and brought home, whichever nation you may come from and whatever background you may be. Can I ask you, have you put your trust in the mercy of God? Are you still relying on your merit, your goodness? You're never going to get there. It's just dead-end religion. Or have you put all of your eggs in the one basket of the God who is rich in mercy and has come to you in Jesus to draw you home? And finally, worship the God that you don't understand, but who made you and therefore who you belong to. It's how the passage finishes. And with these words, I'll close. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments, his paths beyond tracing out. No one would have thought of this plan. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Nobody advises God. And we're not even invited to express an opinion. Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? You'll never have him in your debt so that he owes you anything. For from him and through him, and for him are all things, including you, including me. To him be the glory forever and ever. Thanks for listening. Let's worship.